the ulama, but really uh, the great ulama. And, and they have been clearly identified. There are ones that are agreed upon, and then there's ones that um, are not agreed upon. Um, an agreed upon scholar would be somebody like Abu Hamad al Ghazali, uh, Fakhruddin al Razi. Um, I mean, obviously, the first, the early period, the four Imams, um, people like, uh, and then each one, according to uh, Al Farayini, each one has his area of expertise that he's known for. So, for instance, in Usul al Fiqh, Imam al Ghazali is probably, if not the greatest, certainly one of the greatest of the Usuli scholars in, in the history of Islam. Uh, and then in Tafsir, somebody like Imam Tabari or Imam al Qurtabi or Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi or uh, from the Hanafi school, somebody like um, uh, Imam al Tahawi uh, in, in, in Fiqh. Um, and then in, in Hadith, Ibn Batal or uh, Qadayyad, or Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, or Imam al-Aini. I mean, these are agreed upon Imams because their books are used. Then you have the, the ulama that there, you'll find differences of opinion about, like Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Arabi, the, the famous um, philosophical Sufi, um, who was also a muhaddith and a mufassir, like uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, who was uh, a muhaddith and a mufassir. These were actually encyclopedic uh, giants in terms of the actual amount of information that they, they had amassed uh, in the religion. But you'll find ulama differ about them. So some ulama will say that Ibn Taymiyyah is a kafir, and, and then other ulama will say he's Shaykh al Islam. Some ulama will say about Ibn Arabi that he's Shaykh al Akbar. And then other ones will say he's a kafir. So you'll find this in the tradition. You'll find these, these splits. With those type of imams, generally the, the Ahl al-Sunnah tended to avoid them. You will find areas where they were, they were greatly honored. Um, and, uh, but overall their books uh, were not read a lot. Now in, in the case of Ibn Arabi, I think he did have quite a following uh, in, in, uh, in the Ottoman uh, tradition and certainly in Syria he had a lot of um, followers and in Iran oddly enough uh, the Iranians honor him largely through Al Qashani's work um, because the Irfani tradition that's there um, uses him. So my point being is that you're going to find the Imams that people differ about um, and then you'll find the ones. Now Abu Hamid to be fair there was some difference early on. There were ulama that rejected him, um, like Imam al-Maziri and uh, Abu Bakr al-Turtushi, Sidi al-Harazim. The, the ummah pretty much agreed upon his imam. Uh, they called him Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. Um, and so the idea now, because you have groups that attack him, historically he was not attacked. He, he, was, he was really honored in the community. Some people considered him weak in hadith. Um, and, and towards the end of his life, he started reading hadith quite uh, assiduously. But prior to that, he was, uh, he was more known for his fiqh and for his uh, uh, tasawwuf. So his tizkiyah, which is the ihya. And, and he's considered a mujaddid by, I mean, the, the ulama, as far as I can tell, they're pretty much agreed upon that, that he was the mujaddid of that period of time that he lived in and, and his effects still go on. And so my point being that you will find differences of opinion and, and those that are agreed upon, they also are under the microscope. So not all of their opinions are taken and over time they'll look back and, they, and, and, and scholars will say, well, he was wrong here, or he was wrong there. So it's not like everybody, just because they reach that level, that they're not open to criticism. They are, and, and they will be criticized. Some of their opinions will be challenged by later scholars. During their lifetime, generally, the ulama say, you know, they call them, uh, uh, Imam al-Qarafi mentioned, I think, that the fuqaha 
were like, to use Ad Zariba, they're like goats fighting over uh, the garbage heap. You know, they, there's a lot of hasad uh, amongst uh, scholars, which was traditionally wise. T- contemporaneous scholars did not bear witness against other scholars. You have to really kind of wait to see what the Ummah says uh, down the road about them, because their contemporaries will often be against them simply because uh, there's uh, sickness in the souls and they have hasad and uh, the, the ulama themselves have um, those sicknesses. But um, over time, those greats become part of the canon and their books enter into the canon. And, and this is why you will find certain books are studied over and over and over again throughout history. And those are the most important books to read because uh, they, they, they're, they're given a tawfiq and they're given, a, uh, they're given an honorific position in the library of the Muslims when somebody like uh, Ibn Arabi, to use as an example, somebody like Ibn Arabi who was trained in Andrusia and most of his shiuch were in Andrusia, he comes to Ponya and he ends up giving khutbah and, and teaching and marrying in the culture here. Um, his son-in-law, Sadruddin al-Qunawi, was one of the great muhaddithin of that time. Al-Ajluni said that Ibn Arabi was considered a thiqa in hadith during his time. So uh, his hadith were sound. Uh, the point being is that you could have somebody from a completely different culture in Spain, come to Turkey, and they fit right in with the ulama. It's, it's really something stunning about the Islamic civilization. Um, and so, if you go, for instance, you know, I studied largely with Mauritanians, but the books that I studied, when I meet people from uh, the Dioband Madrasa, they studied a lot of the same books because they're in the same tradition. And even if they aren't the same books, the subject matter is so similar that we know the same technical vocabulary and we can communicate about um, these things because usul al-fiqh, it differs a little bit in the Hanafi as opposed to the Shafi'i or the Maliki uh, usuli tradition. There's some differences in the mustarahat, but overall it's very...